Praise team, thank you so much for that worship. Appreciate that. You know, um, this morning we're beginning our third series in the book of Ephesians, and in case you haven't been here, our, our first section that we covered answered the question, who am I? And we talked about our identity in Christ and how God sees us. And last week we finished our, our second series entitled, What is My Purpose? And we talked about a lot of the things that God has planned out for us to give our life meaning. And today we're going to be starting a third series in the book of Ephesians entitled, How Should We Live? Um, I wonder how many of you, it's an old movie now, but how many of you have seen the movie Princess Diaries? Any, any of you seen that? A lot of you have seen that? Well, in Princess Diaries, a, a common girl is discovered to be royalty, and so she must be taught how to behave like royalty, and that's kind of part of the, the comedy of the movie, was her being kind of awkward and, and being anything but royalty in the way she, she normally lived to see how she became more and more like who she was as royalty. And that's so much like our Christian life. It begins with us coming to faith in Jesus Christ from all kinds of different backgrounds and being given all the riches and benefits of being in God's family. And we learn that because we're different, we can act different. And so the, the next section in the book of Ephesians, we're discovering more and more what it means to live out our new identity to live out our purpose. So in Ephesians chapter 5, where we're taking up today, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to these believers in, in Ephesus, reminding them and us that we're more than just forgiven sinners. I think some people, when they think of themselves as, as a Christian, the main thing they think about is that we're forgiven, but we're still sinners. And Paul's trying to help them understand we're much more than that, that we're children of God, and because of this, we can live differently than ever before. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. If you have an app on your phone or if you have an actual physical copy of a, of a Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And the first thing we're going to see is that as children of God, we should share a family resemblance. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. He begins by telling us we should be different. We, we should be more like God. And he says the way that we do that is we should be imitators of God. And what does it mean to be an imitator? It's uh, one who's like a copycat or one who mimics someone else or one that's a follower of someone's example. And so he's saying that we should be imitators of God because he's our heavenly father, that we should be like him. And you know, if you think about it and you really grasp that idea of who we are in Christ, that we're now children of God, that we're part of God's family, we would say it's only right because we're his dearly loved children. That because of that, we should act like him. It's only natural for children to imitate their parents. And you know, if you have children of your own or grandchildren, you probably see yourself in them. Isn't that kind of scary? When, when you see a, a quality of yours, maybe not one of your best qualities, and there it is in little form, and they're acting like you do, they talk like you do, they say things like you do, and sometimes they, they look like you. And, and I know sometimes the, that's the one thing our kids hate to hear is, yeah, you look just like me. You know, you're looking more and more like me. And they're thinking, no, I don't think so. <laughs> You're old and you have no hair. I don't look anything <laughs> like you. But it's true that they start looking more and more like you. Their temperament, 
their mannerisms. And just as we are like our physical parents, so also we should be like our spiritual father. And so the big question comes up, how can we be like God? Doesn't, doesn't that sound almost uh, impossible that we could be like God? How do we imitate deity? Well, theologians talk about two different kinds of characteristics or attributes of God. I'm going to give you just a little theology lesson today for free. Um, one is his incommunicable attributes, meaning the things that God has uniquely to himself. And it might be hard to think of some of those things, but things like self-existence, that he wasn't created, he, he has always been there, that he's not dependent on anyone else for, for his existence or his being. How about another one, omnipresence, that he is everywhere at the same time. We can't be omnipresent. Or immutability, the fact that God never changes, that he's always the same, that he's consistent. Or infinity, again, something we can't even grasp infinity, much less what that might be like. So those are his incommunicable attributes. So when we say we're like God, it's not in those areas. But there are some, a second category called his communicable attributes. It's qualities that he shares with his creation, with his people. And those are qualities like wisdom, or, or faithfulness, or mercy, or truth, or grace, or love. Um, those are all things that we can share in, or we can be like, or we can demonstrate. Of course, not perfectly, but to some extent, we can be truthful, and we can be gracious, and we can be loving, and merciful, and faithful, and wise. So when we say we need to imitate God or imitate our Heavenly Father, it's in those areas. As we read the Gospels and we look at Jesus' life and we see his character, we say, well, what would Jesus do in that situation? Uh, can I be like that? Can I grow into that kind of character where we're forgiving and gracious and faithful and loving? The one main area I think that he especially emphasizes is in verse 2 where he says, And walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. We should live lives characterized by Christ-like love. We're to live a life characterized by unselfishness. Uh, that's the idea of walking in love. And you know, one thing I think we need to make clear right from the beginning, when you hear the word love, it's not Hollywood-like love. It's, it's a completely different kind of love. And I, li I like how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Wow, what a list. What a description of what God-like love is. And so when you think about how should I imitate my Heavenly Father, think about those characteristics. And maybe if you uh, want to take the time, you might want to look at 1 Corinthians 13 sometime on your own and, and just allow those qualities to go through your mind and through your heart and pray uh, for God to develop those in you. Jesus Christ demonstrated that kind of love in his life and in his death. In his life, he was, he was unselfish. He was constantly thinking about his disciples and what would be best for them. He was thinking about uh, the people in Israel that he was preaching to. He was thinking about um, sometimes his mom and, and maybe his brothers and sisters. 
but he, he was not thinking about his own selfish interests. And so the phrase that's uh, given here in this passage is he gave himself for us. He, he died in our place. He died on our behalf. He didn't die just as an example. I know there are some that think, well, Jesus was just a wonderful example. He was a good teacher, but he was more than that. He was a substitute. He took our place. He received what we deserved on the cross. His death fulfilled the offerings of the Old Testament. Warren Wearsby in his commentary says, Paul compares Christ's sacrifice on the cross to the Old Testament sweet savor sacrifices that were presented at the altar in the temple. The idea behind sweet savor is simply that the sacrifice is well-pleasing to God. This doesn't suggest that God is pleased that sin demands death and that his son had to die to save lost sinners. Rather, it indicates that the death of Christ satisfies the holy law of God and therefore is acceptable and pleasing to the Father. The sweet savor offerings are described in Le Leviticus 1 to 3. The burnt offering, the meal offering, and the peace offering. The burnt offering pictures Christ's complete devotion to God, the meal offering, his, his perfection of character, and the peace offering, his making peace between sinners and God. Since the sin offering and the trespass offering picture Christ taking the place of the sinner, they are not considered sweet savor offerings. But that's what he's talking about there, where it says he gave himself for us, at the end of verse 2, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. That God found it acceptable. You know, I, I think we need to understand that because sometimes we think, you know what, maybe if I'm committed enough, maybe if I read my Bible enough, or maybe if I'm, I, I give to the poor more, or, or maybe if I forgive someone that's wronged me, then that's going to pay for all the bad things that I've done. It's not going to. It's not enough to satisfy God's holy demands, but Jesus' death was. And that's good news. What we couldn't do, Jesus did for us, even at great cost to himself. And so as we think about this, and as Thanksgiving is coming up, and we're going to be with family, um, think about it in a little different way, in application. Do you share in the family resemblance? In other words... Do you demonstrate Christ-like, sacrificial, unselfish love? That, you know, there, there's always things that we can do to sacrifice for others. In fact, a, a good question is, one way to know that we have the family resemblance is, have you ever responded to a need with sacrificial love? Have you ever seen a need um, that someone had, and, and maybe it's a family member, uh, member, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a stranger, and you sacrificed to bless them. That's the family resemblance. The ultimate example of that, of God-like love, is seen in being willing to die for another person. You ever been willing to die for someone? You know, there's... There's a lot of people. I can't even count how many people I would probably not voluntarily die for. <laughs> Don't laugh. It might be some of you. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you probably wouldn't die for me either. So, <laughs> No, but gosh, there are a few. There's a few. My grandkids, my kids, without question. But God is saying, when you demonstrate that kind of sacrifice, that kind of unselfishness, you're showing the family resemblance. And especially, I, I think, for us as, as dads who God has called to be spiritual leaders, are, are we willing to lay down our lives for our families? It, it might not be our physical life, but, but it might be in other ways, putting their needs first. Are we selfish? And we want what we want. And this kind of love has a divine origin. In other words, it's not something we can produce just by saying, I'm going to do this. Um, it's, it's something that only God can give us. And in uh, 1 John 4, 7 and 8 and 19, it says this. 
Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. And then in 19 it says, we love because he first loved us. So I'm hoping you're getting a little bit more of the picture here. That, that to, to properly live out the Christian life, it begins with a focus on God. To be an imitator of him. To, to show his kind of love. To, to have the, the family resemblance. And then Paul goes into another part in verses 3 and 4 where he's telling us what our lives shouldn't be like. And he says, as children of God, our lives should be free from impurity. Look at verse 3. But sexual immorality or any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for the saints. Obscene and foolish talk or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks. Let's pause there. He tells us on the negative exhortation side, we shouldn't be characterized by immoral activities and desires. And the way he describes it is with uh, three different terms here. W one is um, sexual immorality. In other words, um, immoral sex, illicit sex. Um, impurity, which is uncleanness. It's the filthiness that was seen in the pagan Roman culture, and greed, insatiable, coveting, and lustful, always a desire for more. When I think about greed, I think about a, a quote or a question that was once posed to um, uh, John D. Rockefeller, who was a multimillionaire, if not a billionaire, uh, one of the early ones in American uh, culture. And they asked Mr. Rockefeller, um, what do you really want, and, and when is it enough? What is enough money? He had more money than probably all of us combined, and they asked him, what is enough money? And he said, just a little bit more. And that's how we are sometimes. We can be blessed with so many things, but there's a, a greed that wants more and more. And the Lord is saying here that that shouldn't be what we're characterized by. That shouldn't be what our life looks like. In fact, he says in the exhortation, it should not even be heard of among you. This, this shouldn't be true of us, or it shouldn't even be condoned by us. And you know what? It's so hard in our culture, in our world, that uh, there's kind of no shame anymore. You know what I mean? You see things on TV, uh, you hear, you hear hip-hop songs or whatever, and and you just think, oh my goodness, did they really say that? Did I really hear that right? Whether it's news stories or whether it's TV shows or movies, it seems like there is such a focus on sexual perversion and immorality. I mean, it seems like every day I hear about some other kind of letter, you know, the LGBTQ+, plus whatever, 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 and there's just one more thing, you know, and it's supposed to be something that we just condone and say, you know what, that's fine, that's normal. God says these things are not to be even heard of amongst you. And he says the reason, it says, as is proper for or among the saints. They're improper, they're unfit for God's holy people. We're to be set apart for God's use. And you know, I think that's something that's kind of unpopular today, even among Christian circles, the, the whole idea about that we should be different, that we should stand out, not, not because we look funny, but because we act different, that someone should be able to line up a, a group of people and say, after watching your behavior, watching your language, watching your lifestyle, it's really clear that you three are different from the other seven. And I wonder if that's what would be said of us. He goes a little more specific in, in verse 4. He says that um, obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving of thanks. We shouldn't be characterized by offensive speech. 
And the way he describes it, he, he, he uses the word obscene, which is filthiness or, or shameless speech. He, he speaks of foolish talk, which is the speech of a, of a drunkard, it's drunk talking, uh, or of a fool. It's, it's, it's senseless or crude joking, which is vulgar humor. You know, it seems like today most stand-up comics are vulgar. Um, it just seems like at one time people could be funny without having to be vulgar. Have you noticed that, that change? And that it seems like the mo more vulgar you get, um, the more funny it's supposed to be. And to me, that isn't such an indictment on the comedian. It's an indictment on the culture. Because if a comedian was so vulgar or obscene that everybody walked out on him, no one ever bought tickets to their shows, then um, they would change, right? I think it's because that's what they think people want. And so that's an indictment, not so much on the, the artist, on the comedian, on the songwriter, as, as maybe on our culture and on ourselves. And the reason that he gives is it's not suitable. It's out of place. It's not fitting. It doesn't match with who we are. You know, our, our culture has changed in a lot of ways, and I think in some ways it's good. Um, if you would have seen me 25 years ago at this church, I would be wearing a tie. I don't wear ties very much. Sometimes I do on Communion Sunday just because I want to. But that was kind of the expectation. Um, being from Southern California, things were a little more casual for me growing up. And so I remember when I went to seminary in Dallas, Texas, I went to a Sunday evening service, which I thought was the more casual service, and I had an open collar shirt. And man, I got it from some people. They go, oh, you're from California, aren't you? You know? And there's just something that didn't seem fitting to them about how I was dressed. And you know what? I'm kind of thankful that that isn't true anymore. Because I, I, I think that it's, it's really nice that someone can come in that is not a regular churchgoer, maybe not even a believer, and you can invite them to church and they're not worried about uh, not fitting in because they're not dressed up. I don't know that you have to be dressed up to come to church. In fact, I don't think you do. Um, I think it's okay that, that we don't wear coats and ties and that women you know, all have to wear dresses. It's, that's fine, because those are external kinds of things. But there are other kinds of things, whether it's our, our language, things that we say, um, the way we behave, and it's worse than wearing a, a t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops to church. It just doesn't fit, but it's a deeper issue. It, it's more about our character and our heart sometimes, because it shows itself often in our behavior. And you know one that, that isn't um, mentioned here, but I, I think it's implied where he talks about obscene and foolish talking, crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving of thanks. I wonder as we think about Thanksgiving if ungratefulness is something also that's not suitable or constant grumbling or complaining or, or being negative. Maybe that's not suitable too. I think, I think that's what he's getting at where he says it is suitable that we give thanks, that we have that kind of a thankful heart and attitude. So the application thought of the second uh, part of this uh, passage is our sexual behavior and speech indicate the state of our minds and hearts. And so think about that. Think about the way you behave and the way you talk. And then lastly, in verses 5 and 6, it says why we're to live this way, and it's because we're heirs of God's kingdom. For no one recognize this. Every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Given the context of Ephesus and what was going on, I think his, his direct thought or point is toward the false teachers. And I, I really believe that he's saying these false teachers who promote immoral, impure, greedy lives and their followers have no inheritance 
in the kingdom. Not that a child of God will never fall into these sins. Um, Sometimes something slips out. Maybe a crude joke or, or maybe foolish talk. That doesn't mean, well, you're not a Christian for sure. But those that promote these things and whose lives are characterized by these things, he says they're idolaters. They're not true believers. I remember hearing a a message by Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Anybody heard of Dr. J. Vernon McGee? It goes back a long ways. He had a, um, a program on the radio where he went through the Bible verse by verse. Uh, it took him three years, and I don't know how many times he did that, four or five times, and I think it's actually still on the radio, or I'm sure you can find it on the Internet. But I remember he told a story, and it was one that was just kind of his own um, imagination, but I liked the point of it. He, he said, you know, there is the prodigal son, and we all know about the prodigal son, that he wanted his inheritance, and he left home, and he went to a far-off land, and he wasted all of his money on riotous living, and then he found himself feeding pigs, which was not heard of for Jewish boys in those days. And he got so hungry, he wanted to eat the pig's food, and he came home. And do you remember what happened? His dad was waiting for him. And he ran to embrace him, not to rebuke him, not, not to tell him what a horrible son he was, but to restore him. And so what did he say? He said, um, get the fatted calf, we're going to have a celebration. So there was a wonderful party, and there was a celebration, and he, he put on him a, a robe and sandals and a, a ring on his finger, and he celebrated his son's return. Well, Dr. McGee said, well, just what would have happened if um, the son, when he came back, decided to bring one of the pigs with him? Gotten friends, became friends with one of the pigs like a pet. So he brought the pig back, and he cleaned him all up and maybe put a little bow tie on him, put him at the table where there was a celebration and the pig was eating. And all of a sudden, the pig was uncomfortable. He didn't like being there. And he looked around, and over off in the distance, he saw a big mud puddle. And boy, the first chance he gets, that tie is off, and he is off to that mud puddle because that's what he's comfortable with. And Dr. McGee says, that's the sign. It, it, it's not in the moment what you look like, but it's the consistency of your life and the direction of your life. And there's a difference between a prodigal son and a prodigal pig. Because the son, when he's restored to his family, he knows he belongs there. And he becomes comfortable with it, but the pig cannot stand it can't wait to get back in the mud, in the dirt, in the filth, and that's a picture. It's a picture of people's lives. And so Paul is saying it doesn't make any sense for us to imitate these false teachers. In verse 6, he gives us a warning, do not be deceived. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. What does he mean? He he says, we live in a time, he lived in a time when the culture promoted immoral behavior, selfish living, and that there are no consequences for our action. Doesn't it seem that way sometimes? That people get away with everything and there's no consequences. In fact, sometimes it's flipped upside down to where the people that do have a conscience and do stand up for what's right, they're the ones that are persecuted. You notice that? Things are all mixed up. They're all twisted. And Paul says that's deception. That's the lie. So don't be deceived. Don't don't somehow think that, you know what? It's okay. We can get away with all these things. There's no consequences. Paul's saying God's wrath is coming. There will be a day of judgment. And we see consequences both in eternity and now. And so wrapping this up, so how should we live? We should live as imitators of God our Father. We should live lives free of impurity and as heirs of God's kingdom. And so again, the question comes up, are you different? 
as a Christian? Are you distinguishable as a child of God? Do you resemble your heavenly Father? We need to remember who we are. We need to remember how we're to live. We're to remember God's grace shown in our lives. I want to close with this. This is from Max Lucado in his book, In the Grip of Grace. How could we who have been freed from sin return to it? Before Christ, our lives were out of control, sloppy and indulgent. We didn't even know we were slobs until we met him. Then he moved in. Things began to change. What we threw around, we began putting away. What we neglected, he cleaned up. What had been clutter became order. Oh, and there were and still are occasional lapses of thought and deed, but by and large, he got our house in order. Suddenly, we find ourselves wanting to do good. Go back to the old mess? Are you kidding? In the past, you were slaves to sin. Sin controlled you. But thank God, you fully obeyed the things that you were taught. You were made free from sin, and now you are slaves to goodness. Can a discharged prisoner return to confinement? Yes, but let him remember the gray walls and the long nights. Can a newlywed forget his vows? Yes, but let him remember his holy vow and his beautiful bride. Can a converted slob once again be messy? Yes, but let him consider the difference between the filth of yesterday and the purity of today. Can one who has been given a free gift not share that gift with others? I suppose. Let him remember that he received a free gift. Let him remember that all of life is a gift of grace. And then let him remember that the call of grace is to live a gracious life. For that's how grace works. Let's bow our heads. Perhaps you've come today and you've never taken that step of faith and trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's really simple. You just need to repent, have a change of mind about your sin and the way you've been living, and turn to Christ. Receive his gift of forgiveness and eternal life. And when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, God promises that he'll clean the slate, that we're adopted as his children, that we're part of his family, that we share in the riches of Christ, and that we can have that assurance of eternal life. So if you've never done it, I, I'd urge you today, even right now, put your faith in Jesus, accept him. And those of us that are Christians, that have taken that step of faith, Let's be reminded once again who our Father is and the life that is fitting to live because we're children of the living God. We're children of the King of Kings. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for innumerable blessings that we have because we belong to you. And Lord, I pray that we'd want to share that in the way that we live, in the words that we speak, and in the way we treat one another. Lord, give us a heart and a compassion for those without you. Rather than pointing the finger and being judgmental and feeling superior, may we ache for them. May we pray for them. May we desire for those that we come into contact with that are without hope, without faith that they would come to you and that we might be that means that you use to bring them to your son. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.